it's another edition of Pens Down. Here we talk the journalists, uh, we talk to journalists about their journalism journeys, the things they grapple with, all that they go through, which never get reported. I have been joined by a colleague who is a correspondent for the multimedia group, and she's held that position since 2016, reporting on all sectors and conducting major interviews from Ghana's Western and Western North regions. Through her works, she highlights the plights of the vulnerable and underprivileged within her jurisdiction. She began her career in 2014 at Radio Max in Takrade, rising through the ranks to become news editor. She designed and edited content for the station's local news, which concentrated on social concern as well as business. Between 20, 2017 and 2019, August, she worked alone to produce and read news for the station, co-creating a, a weekly business show called Business Agenda with the then news editor, Francis Waja. She has reported and written extensively about how poor rules hinder agriculture within her catchment area, particularly in the Western North region where cuckoo is grown widely. I have been joined on Pens Down today by my colleague, Inatalia Kwansa. Welcome. Thank you. It's a privilege to be here. I'm also excited that you finally made it here. Um, first of all, how did you discover the journalist in you? What exactly brought you into journalism in the first place? Mm -hmm. So um, growing up from a village in the central region called Gumwa uh, as a little girl, I saw how deplorable where I come from, my hometown was. And the fact that they didn't really have anyone to speak for them. Mm. It was always about them. And then I also saw something they used to call communal labor. And so they come together and then they do their own stuff. And then watching TV, people like um, Emma Morrison, affectionately called Miss Mo, um, Gifty Auntie, and those people. And as I said, I told my uncle, I want to be like these people. I want to be the voice for the community. And so that has been me from age seven mm. till, um, um, till 2014, when I finally graduated with a diploma in journalism. And I said, let me kick start. Let me start moving. And so that was it. Mm. Does journalism pay? Does it pay? <laughs> this question, I know you have an answer to it. I know. Um, <laughs> it's just like the Bible say that it's a two-edged sword. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Financially paying, you might not see it mm. from the onset, but journalism does pay in a way because you and I really know that even though financially you might not get what you put in there or mm. what you expect to get. It gives you a lot of leverages. It gives you a lot of links. It's open other avenues. Mm -hmm. And so even if you are not getting paid for the journalism work you are doing, you can do side hustle connected to communication. And it's because of the journalism you are doing, that's how come you got that. And mm -hmm. so journalism in a way, that's paid. But not as expected. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of attrition in the field of journalism. So many trained, qualified professionals are leaving the field in numbers. I am sure when you came, some of the people you met are nowhere to be found. There are others who even met you and have left. What do you think is accounting for this high level of attrition that journalism is suffering? Mm. You see, I have this particular topic I'm so passionate about, mm. um, the working condition of a journalist. Okay, so I remember when I came into journalism first, there was this early man, he's gone, may he so rest in peace, who told me that 
a juma way into our in our local policy. That's right. Um, do I it doesn't pay? Do I want to do it? Um, there are a lot of oldies who have left journalism and they have nothing to show. Mm. And so it is always um you, you know, hustling day and night, getting to speak for people, getting to do people's bidding and all that. When yourself you are not even being recognized so like the working condition of a, of a journalist for instance the journalist does not speak about what he or she goes through the journalist does not go on strike the remunerations are forbidden subjects and all that um plans for the journalist when he's on retire except a few me, public media houses or private media houses who does that there are still um, media houses where they pay on tabletop and so I mean someone will start the, there is the passion I want to do more I really want to you know explore but at, at some point in time when we think about the future because mind you in as much as is a noble profession we are still thinking about putting something on the table in the house. You're right. People are calling you. People see you on TV and they will call you. Oh, I need help. And you tell them you can't tell. Family mm. members look up to you and you tell them no. Someone will ask you, is it nob nobility that you would, you know, eat? eat? <laughs> <laughs> That's not what we will eat. We have bills to pay. Mm. And so I think this is some of the reasons why people are leaving because they, they really want to secure their future and then um, their finances. Mm -hmm. And then security-wise, I can make mention of um Lati from multimedia. Yes. You know what happened to him? We are not secured. I mean, someone beats you and then goes cost free. Yes, GJ will bring out letters. We are, but at the end of the day, what do we see? And so people want to secure their finances. People want places where they will feel more secured. People will speak for them. Because the job of the journalist is like you are speaking for everyone, but who is speaking for you? You mm. have no one. I think that that is some of the issues accounting for all this we are seeing. Mm. Mm. What stands out as the most challenging assignment or set of assignments that you've undertaken these years you've been in journalism? Okay. So uh, one of the most challenging ones I can mm -hmm. recall, and I know that when I mentioned everyone will recall, is covering the missing Takradi girls. Yes. The covering that story for close to a year mm. was very stressful emotionally, financially, physically, because this is where um, we are talking about girls. I'm a lady myself. And then some of the stories which didn't come to the frontage for everyone to hear. I mean, when you speak to their families behind, when you speak to people, some of the comments they make and all that, you see that it drains you. And then security wise, I mean, you are leading. Every day you are on, on set, it's talking mm. about the messenger Friday girl. Every day you are doing this. And so your security, because um, just like Kofi Kenata said, Takradi day, your, your girlfriend is our girlfriend. Everybody knows you in a way. It's a it's, it's a city, a metropolitan assembly, but people can easily figure out where you are, where you live. And so for me, whilst covering that story continuously, I felt challenged for my own security wise. I had to be more security conscious. Yeah. I have to be on top of issues. So this that is one. And then going to rural communities. We all know how rural Ghana is, especially in the Western and Western North region where I cover, which I can speak for. Yeah. Our road work is so bad. And so imagine I'm going to a place like Assem Krum uh, in the our win municipality. Yeah. And now covering a story from that area and then, you know, the bad road network connectivity. And so I have to stay on the road for, let's say, sometimes three days, four days 
mm. on a motor cycle. And so at every point in time, wherever you get and it's late, you need to sleep. You don't mm. even know where you are sleeping. You don't know the people there. You are not assured that where you are sleeping, you would wake up the next morning, mm. but you have to sacrifice. Mm. And then riding through the bushes at night, there are no police. There are no security. And you don't know who is even taking you on that ride. But because you want to get a story done, you keep on doing it. And so you're safe. So it has been one of the challenging, covering road stories in the rural communities mm. and then whole stories. I mean, you, you go and then you see that these people are the producers of cocoa. Mm. But you look at their life and you ask yourself, is it worth it? Mm. Is it worth it? And you see where they live and, and, and you get challenged. Sometimes, mostly it might not be physical, but emotionally, mm. you are challenged as a journalist telling the story. So mm. these are some of the difficult um, situations and I, I have to end you. And then, yes, let me add the last one. Mm. The 2020 election was not easy for me. Mm. When you are coming, stories and you are receiving threats from so-called um party guys mm. uh, sometimes or you think you are doing your job and they are threatening your life and they can look to you look you in your face and tell you that even if we do something to you even if we harm you no one can do anything to us mm. and you ask yourself are, are you safe is it is this job worth dying for and in the midst of all that, you also needed to be safe because of COVID. Of COVID, yes, Nana. <laughs> Three days after this election, you know, we don't sleep during election. Exactly. And so, yeah, so I was going to cover a program somewhere. And then when we went, they said we should do a COVID test. And that's, I had not slept throughout. And then, you know, moving from here and there, mm. running all about. They did this test and these people told me that um, we can trace symptoms of COVID with you. Nana, I, I got to understand why people commit suicide. Mm. Because at that point when they told me they, they can trace symptoms and signs of COVID, I felt my whole world has come to an end. I I I I was so like destroyed mm. from every part of my life. So I took a car, came back home. The only thing I did was that time relatives, families are visited because it was during the December Christmas mm. season. The only thing I did was to get into my bedroom, lock myself up. They didn't speak to anyone for two days. They kept on knocking. Ina, what is wrong with you? I said nothing. I don't want to see anyone. And I was asking myself, am I also going to die like those that we have seen dying? What is what is going to happen to me? Because I was also afraid of the stigma. Mm. I wasn't ready to go to any COVID center or hospital. Look at me preaching people to go. But I wasn't <laughs> ready to go because I was afraid of the stigma. How mm. would people see me? How would people welcome me? And so that was also challenging. I think on the back of this, then journalists on the field need psychological support to handle some of these things. Absolutely. You are right. We need psychological support. We we need it badly. Mm. Mm. Has social media taken away the monopoly over breaking news from the traditional media? <laughs> it's it's can take over but to some extent it has. Mm. To some extent it has in the sense that before you think you would take your time, do proper research into what you know, bring out the uh, correct, accurate, because you believe that um, journalism is about accuracy and order. Before you do that, they've already broken the news. And mm. so your news has it in somewhere, things that you are lazy. Your media house thinks that. And so now it has become like most often it's not about bringing out accuracy, but who brings the story out first. Mm. So mm. social media is really, you know, competing with the traditional media when it comes to breaking news, when it comes to stories, even though sometimes 
some of the stories they bring are not reliable. And then some of the headlines are so misleading that you see the headline, you open and you are like, ah, so couldn't they have done something better to this? <laughs> <laughs> you know it, Nana. You, you yeah. I know you. you That's the right. Most mm. uh -huh. And so it's, it has, it can't be monopoly, but to some extent, it is having an adverse effect on the traditional media when it comes to breaking news. How has social media changed the practice of journalism generally? And for you? <laughs> generally, it's 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 been positive and negative. Mm. Mm. Positive in the sense that now any every anyone at all can access your stories online. Anyone at all who wants to know about who you are, what you do as a journalist, your work and all that, you can put it on social media and anyone at all can just go and then get it. Mm -hmm. But in another breath, someone can take your information and then just turn it around, write something which is never true. Probably you've written a story in a certain way they would take it and then they would write it in another way, mm. especially people who are not trained journalists and who do not know the ethics and then the norm when it comes to journalism. They can yeah. just take your story and then do it what they want, write it how they want. Sometimes it's even, you know, comes down to deal with your integrity and your mm. credibility. Mm. And we know of people picking... um um well-known journalists and other people's pictures in so many forms and doing mm. a lot of things with this mm. and so you pick your picture and then they are portraying it anyway and uh, let me just go straight like um, this lotto forecast and all that mm -hmm. you see people on social media sorry taking people's picture, people that they know that these are credible people and yeah. then using it as if it's just them impersonation which is very wrong mm. and then on the other side the kind of stories um they come out with just like i had indicated earlier social media has given everyone the right to do anything mm. and so once the person thinks i have a phone i have internet let me just record something and then put it down on social media and it flies and so sometimes your credibility and then the credibility of journalists it's mm. a stake when it comes to social media. It is good and it is bad. But sometimes how we also use it is very important. Yeah. People are making money today. And so if you are a journalist, then you can even, you know, brand yourself very well. Let's give a typical example of Kofi Adoma mm -hmm. and the rest. They are yeah. using social media and they are still in journalism and they are doing wonderful works. Mm. And so social media is a two-way thing, depending mm. on how you use it or how it works for you as a journalist. Apart from the 2020 election incident, which you cited, mm. have you ever received threats in the line of duty? Never. I don't mm. remember any. Yeah, that, I think that's that's the first time. Mm. Yeah. Should journalists be licensed? Why not? Journalists like um any other professions should professions should be uh, should be licensed. You see, I, I was just like you we have other places that uh, people's voices are insured and all mm. that. Mm. As a journalist, if you lose your voice. Mm. Fine, you have power in your hands to write. But if you lose your voice, what happens to you? These are some of the questions that people should start to think about when you, you ask of should journalists be licensed? Mm. Okay, um, let me go back. When journalists are licensed, like medical doctors, um, mm. like lawyers. lawyers, workers, and all that, then we can really streamline who journalists and who journalists are not. Mm -hmm. And so no one at all can wake up in the morning and call himself or herself a journalist. Because Nana, trust me, we know a lot of people who go for some two, three days training 
they get phones, they get some credits, and then they call themselves journalists. Mm. They don't go by the ethics of journalism. Most of them, I, I, I don't want people to come at me. Most of them, <laughs> they, they go around and then, sorry to say, all they are interested in is the solidarity. Yeah. All they are interested in is the no fuel, mm. but they are not interested in doing professional work. Mm. And then we are licensed, like I was citing. We can quote that a journalist who has practiced for, let's say, this year, for this amount of years, a journalist with this degree, cross-board, irrespective of the media house, should be given this amount of money. The assets should be paid because we have a pro we have a licensed body which mm. is taking over it. Not saying that GJ is not there, but if we are mm. licensed, we can check journalists, check media houses, and then even check what we put out there. Mm. Mm. So this is very necessary. Let's talk about that's solid. That's what I. Oh, you want us to talk about <laughs> solid? <laughs> Oh, we shouldn't talk about Sally. Sally, dear, why? <laughs> why do you want to talk about this, Sally? On pairs down, anytime I have mentioned that, whether to a Ghanaian or a non Ghanaian, in mm -hmm. their own language, it always mm -hmm. draws a smile, just that I got from you. Uh, it's a controversial topic. Yeah. I don't want to prejudice anything. What is your take on it? <laughs> solidarity mm. I mean once a chief said that um, a police for one job bribe the policemen they don't take bribe mm. you see they are black uniform mm -hmm. they are just only paying something to them because they have funeral <laughs> okay <laughs> and so <laughs> <laughs> see solidarity you are just mm. showing solidarity to us mm. and so yes um depending on the way it is taken for me mm. i believe that you don't have to force anyone for mm. solidarity you mm. don't have to be on the neck of people that give me solidarity mm. or give me solace for any reason. You see, what even hurts us after a program and you see journalists queuing, waiting like hungry foot soldiers who have just returned from a war mm. to take solidarity. Yeah. That is what I, I, I just don't think it is right. Mm. If you cover a story and the person feels that I want to appreciate you, I want mm. to give you TNT because you came from somewhere to come and cover the story. Fair enough. But I don't think it should be something that journalists should hold um and if you feel entitled to, to we are not entitled to it. If they give it to us, fair. If they don't give it to you, do your job. Once you do a proper job, it would pay off someday. Once you, you do a proper job, it will pay off someday. Let me cite example of some of these cocoa stories I've been doing. Mm. A typical one is our wind story. The road mm. was so bad, very bad, that people living in the community would not want to move from that street because from um, Assem Chrome to NJ. Mm. So that is um, a road which connects the corridors. Mm. And so a lot of people, who were even living around would not want to go there. I I wake up one morning, I told my cameraman, let's go, let's go and do the story. We should stress ourselves, let's get the story done. Mm. We go on the route, finance it ourselves. And then once um, a big man within the community hears that uh, there are these journalists here doing this kind of story, they call me and they tell me that, People have not come here to do stories. We have journalists living around here and they have not done the story. You came in, you didn't ask for anything. You are just on your own. For doing this, this is for you. Mm. This is beautiful. Other than for me to go there and say that I, I am coming to do this, your road story. Mm. I want you to give me this amount of money. Am I entitled to? 
Yeah. It is my job that I am doing. And if you do a good job, we all know that it's definitely some way would be good in some way for us. Mm. And so we are not entitled to solidarity. Does Soli have any power, even remotely, to influence the work of a journalist? It's 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 two ways. Soli, hmm. Ordinarily shouldn't have any power. Mm. Ordinarily, solidarity shouldn't have any power. Mm. But on pens now, we say it as it is. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we are we are not going to cover up. I mean, this is our that's right. Thing. Yeah. Sometimes trust in some solidarity can teach you what to do. Mm. Some solidarity can can influence your writing skills. Mm. Some solidarity as and, and so it it boils down to discipline. Mm. It boils down to discipline and then knowing the ethics of this job mm. and then having a vision. Because for someone it is just me be I'm just that's right. I'm just doing this professionally. Yeah. But for some of us, this is my job. This is what I want to be known for someday. Mm. Mm. I want my generation to come and be proud that. This is what I uh, this person from our family did. Mm. And so for some of us, probably it might not influence. But in essence, in this generation that we find ourselves, solidarity does influence some journalists. Mm. If you are not disciplined, if you don't know the ethics of the job, if you just want to pass through journalism and then leave somehow, because you feel, let me do anything. And if you are not committed, if the passion is not there, someone can give you some good solid mm. and then you can turn things around. You and put then in more in ink. More ink, you see. <laughs> you, buy, you buy some chilled coke and then you type <laughs> work. <laughs> then they will call that one commercial journalism. It's not journalism. <laughs> It is <laughs> It is commercial. That's yeah, right. but if you know, Nana. One thing I know that once your your integrity, you you sell, you is at stake because once they give you this money and then you are able to go by the abedin, mm. that means they can just turn you around. They can tell you what to do, what yeah. not to do. And you become their puppets at the end of the day. That's true. Yeah. yeah. Has there been any time in the line of duty that you have been approached with anything monetary or material to compromise the facts of a report you were doing so that you take it? Fortunately for me, the kind of stories... Mm. That's not warrants compromise. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there are certain stories you do that right. warrant compromise. Sure, sure. But for me, I, I have positioned myself, even though I do general stories for mm. from the region for the newsroom, mm. there are some line I wouldn't do. And so I am more into developments, okay. women and gender, mm. you know, for other stories, I do them once in a while, but my own is development. Mm. And so who would come and offer you money to stop speaking about the development <laughs> within his or her catchment area? That's right. You don't have mm. roads. Yeah. Why would you give me money not to talk about the roads being poor? Yeah. You don't have good network <laughs> connectivity. A young lady has been defiled. Why should I keep quiet over it? Mm. Mm. there is shortage of water things are not moving at great sector there are issues why should I keep quiet mm. and so I, I haven't gotten there when okay. I get there I'll let you know at the other <laughs> yeah you have done yeah. some eight years mm. if we are to go back into time a time ten years will you still choose journalism for a profession or you look elsewhere Um, 
I I wouldn't do journalism straightly. Okay. Like it's 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 I wouldn't leave journalism because you can't leave journalism. Mm. Once you, you have the passion in you, once you, you really know what you 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 want, mm. journalism is difficult to leave. Mm. And so we have a lot of people saying, oh, I've left, I'm doing something new. But you see them still doing something on the side connected to journalism. That's right. But I even if I would want to leave, it's still connected to communication and journalism. Yeah. Yeah. For me, I would want to do development communication. Okay. That's why now I'm studying um development communication at the Ghana Institute of Journalism. Mm. Uh -huh. Masters, but I would I would still be in the field. I don't know when I would want to leave. No, mm. I don't think I would want to choose any other profession over journalism, mm. wow. even though it doesn't pay. But okay, I'm I am stuck to journalism and communication. Mm. Mm. Yeah. What yeah. are your golden memories? These eight years, high moments, laurels, awards, plaudits, appreciations. And uh, thank yous and all that. Share them with us. My my golden moments are when you I do I do a story, and then we get results for the people. Mm. So for a community like Assam Chrome and uh, Oma and Pehia, for instance, mm. we went to the community, and then the only place they could get access to telephony connectivity was at mm. the cemetery. We did the really? story. Yes. <laughs> I think I have to share that with you. Wow. <laughs> Was at the cemetery. We did the story. And then within that week, um, network providers were calling in the newsroom in Accra because, yes, it was aired on the Joy News channel. They were calling in the newsroom. And then within some few weeks, they went to mount a mast for them and all mm. that. And then we go back to the community and the chief is so happy. The chief is so appreciative. The community members see you and it's like the angel that brought answers to mm -hmm. us has come again. That's right. Mm -hmm. And you visit such community. I remember one of the communities, there was a shortcut for the construction of the road. And then we've, we have gone there for another program and so the people who went there with us really didn't know who we were so we get to the community and then the opinion leaders are like hey you've brought these people this up they are our people these people have done this they've wow. done that and they are so appreciative mm. once you walk in town when people are like is that not Ina? oh that girl she's doing so well like people mm. appreciate what you do and that is the joy of journalism yeah and impact yeah, when you, that is the word, when you impact and then people are so appreciative of what mm. you've done. And that yeah. is good journalism for me. Because yeah. when you do the stories and then, I mean, there is no result. What's the essence of it? And then let's talk about 2019. Okay. Mm. 2019, um, the Ghana Journalists Association in the Western Region chapter decided mm. to organize the first ever um journalism awards okay. in the region and mm. then with this awards um i was recognized um i took three awards home that night in wow. fact i was the only journalist who took more than one award home wow. and so yes i was recognized as the most promising young journalist of the year mm. i was recognized as the news reporter of the year and then wow. i was also given the recognition of the rural reporter of the year i've told wow. you for me i like to do rural stuff wow. that was wow. in october mm. october the following month november i was there and then i had a call from gj national um young lady can we have some of the stories you have done we want to see the works you have done over the years. And then, then Miss Muema Morrison was with Joy News. Mm. She called me and then started asking me questions. I was answering it. For me, I just thought, I mean, a mentor is just asking me questions. Yeah. So I was just answering. Mm. Fast forward in November, yes, I was there. I had a call. Ina, come to Accra. We've left your ticket at the Joy FM. 
um station and so you should join fm so come for your tickets and attend the gg awards i said okay we've left two tickets for you i said okay i mean i had attended one before so okay i, w I was mm. going to attend i get to the venue sitting my somewhere with police from the newsroom <laughs> <laughs> i hear the Kamala Dumont was promising young journalist of the year is in Natalia Kwanza. I'm like, huh? Is it me? So you had <laughs> no clue that it was coming? No. I had wow. no clue. I was just, wow. but proud to um, go in there. Mm. People I didn't have their contact sent me message, congratulations. I, so I thought it was for the Western GG8. And congratulations, mm. you have had well. Congratulations, you've done well. Wow. Not knowing it was for the Komla Dumont most promising young journalist of the year. Wow. And for when we take out everything, the Komla Dumont attached. And so for all the awards I have in my room, it that makes Komla it Dumont, iconic. Iconic for me. <laughs> it's the Komla Dumont mm. for me. Mm. And then that same month, November, mm. it was when they launched the Median Ghana Cocoa Awards. Yes. And for the Coco Awards, I was part of the four journalists nominated. Okay. I was the youngest among them. Mm. I was the only female journalist among them. Mm. Even though I didn't come home with the award, Justice Beidou, my senior colleague, had it. Yeah. But I was so happy that in the whole of Ghana, and for the first time, recognizing journalists who are doing something for cocoa communities mm. in the cocoa sector have been recognized. For me, it, is, it was good. Mm. I, I really appreciate it. Unfortunately, or unfortunately, Justice Bay did not come. And so I had to go and receive it. <laughs> <laughs> I had to go and receive his award for him. Can you imagine? You did not yes. win, but you were a recipient. Fantastic. I, I received this, yes. <laughs> and then we have an, an award scheme in the Western region, also known as Phantom from Amanze Awards, mm. recognizing mm. people doing so well in the Western region. And so I was also recognized. So, so far, yes, I received some few recognition here and there. Wonderful. And well done. I think uh, you are doing well, which is why the appreciation keeps coming mm. but let me find out are you doing journalism for life or there is an end time for you um end time where end time means the time you will drop the mic or you drop your pen and then focus on something else i, I had said earlier that mm. journalism is not something i intend to stop mm. I would do other things, but doesn't mean that I will stop journalism. Because once you have been trained, once you you are you you have all the expertise in journalism. Mm. Mm. I mean, let's say today I leave multimedia, and let's say I am a communication expert for a company or anything, and I see something worth reporting or worth writing on. Mm. And I write and I send it to multimedia. Mm. They can't say they won't publish. Not to say that I have an authority over them, but once mm. it's a good item, it would be published. And yes, now we, we, we also have our own sites and other things where we do publish our own stories and other things. Even those that have been published by the companies we work with, we also share them on our pages and all that. And so we can say, oh, we have other things doing, but not to say that we are leaving journalism. No, mm. we are doing journalism till the Lord calls us. <laughs> oh, you do is, like yeah, I do, I do. It's yes. a lifestyle almost. Mm, yeah. Yeah. What's your most cherished experience from rural reporting? Okay, so for me, um, when it comes to eating, like mm. our uh, colleagues share, yeah. it's something we do every day. Really? Like, the challenges, yes. Wow. You see, you, you, you want the people to feel that you are part of them. Mm. You want them to feel that um, I'm okay because sometimes they feel that 
oh, she's coming from the city, and so she would be a bit in Rabasam Kakra, That's you know, right. mm. she wouldn't feel so comfortable around us. But I also have this um phenomenal that mm. once you get to the rural community, drink from where they drink, mm. eat from where they eat, so that they'll feel that you are part of them. Mm. When sharing information with you, it's uh, so easy. Mm. Once you are able to break that ice, Nana, trust you, it is so easy for them to tell you even things you didn't come there to do. Yeah. They will give you leads upon leads. Mm. And so for me, eating and drinking with them has always been the norm. But oh, you, you end up, sometimes the water you drink, you end up come back home and you react to it. Mm. But one one child one thing I remember was um when we had to sleep over in a cottage sort of mm. and we had to the bed is like a raffia which mm. has been arranged. Wow. So, <laughs> you don't have you don't have the comfort of a mattress. That's right. But this is what we are sleeping on. And, and possibly so, their best they've given yes. you. They, I mean, they, 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 they've given you what they feel is because they tell me that is a guest house for them. Ooh. Wow. <laughs> and so <laughs> you can't tell them that you won't sleep in it. And then yeah. we go and sleep on this thing. And then you see this thousand legs at a point mm -hmm. during the night. I feel something on my body. Mm -hmm. so just to wake up, take my phone and put on the light and it's thousand legs moving on my body. Wow. I didn't sleep again. That's a is it a millipede or centipede? Which is a which? millipede. That's what's wow. that's what they call it. I didn't sleep again. That was it for me for the And night. you couldn't complain either to them. Why would you complain? <laughs> you complain and it makes them look like for them who live there, they are not human beings. Sorry, human beings. Mm. And so you have to endure it and then, you know, keep it to yourself. The following day, they show you a washroom to bath and you are like, God, let me tell you, that sometimes I have to do ablution. <laughs> <laughs> it happens all the time when you are on the field. It happens all the time. Uh -huh. Because the washroom, I mean, you are washing down to clean yourself. But the washroom itself, by the time you finish bathing, I'm sure you're already dirty. Mm. And so, mm. in essence, you don't even feel like. Mm. So, th th that, that is some of the uh, challenging memories with mm. rural reports. Yeah. How do, how do all these realities you come face to face with, how do they firm up your resolve to continue to be a voice for the underprivileged? So, yes, when I see some of these things, I feel that there is more to do. Mm. In the rural areas, they are our backbone as a country. They are providing all the food that we eat. They are working so hard. And so, in essence, I even feel that those places should have been more developed. Mm. Those places should have had the best of everything. You get education, it is not working. There are thousands and one of these communities still studying under tree. Mm. There are thousands and one of these communities still having some mean, makeshift something they call mm. hospitals. Mm. There are thousands and ones of these communities who are still struggling with water, even in this Galamse era, mm. where our waters are polluted with enough mercury and other chemicals, they still have to survive on it. And mm. so in as much as I go through these challenges, when I go through, I come back to the city and I enjoy my life comfortably. I don't stay there for months. The most I will stay in a room community is like a week but these people are still there and so if I tell myself that because of what I have gone through I would shut up keep quiet 
put my pen down, put my microphone down, put the camera down, and then go and look for another job. What becomes of them? Mm. Who is telling their story for them? If I can bring a change in one person's life, I think it's better. Mm. What is the essence of, I'm getting emotional, sorry. What is the essence of leaving my pens and everything down when people are still suffering? Yeah. When people are still suffering and when people still need their, their voices out there. Mm. So for me, that is what keeps me going. And I'm not stopping this. Mm. Yeah. My final question. Mm. A lot of media houses are springing up and they have the signature and fingerprints of politicians and politically exposed persons. Mm. The increasing political ownership of the media. Mm. Is there a reason to be worried? Are we in trouble? Is there trouble on the horizon? Mm. We can see the red flags all, all over. Mm. <laughs> We can see the trouble all over because mm. now if you work with these media houses, even those that are not even for them, mm. they try to have a stake in there. Yeah. You do their bidding. You are a journalist. Let's say well-trained. You are a presenter, well-trained. You know what to do. Mm. But your pay masters will detect to you what to say and what not to say. Mm. They will tell you who to interview and who not to interview. Mm. I know of some of these media houses springing up that probably they are for it's for party A. And so for that station, party B does not speak on it. Yeah. And then if party B, um, there is anything about party B, it's nasty. It's yeah. it's it's just nasty. You, you, you don't even give them the... But we know that journalism is balanced. We have yeah. to hear each side of the story. But That's in right. such... Most of these media houses that are springing up, that mm -hmm. belongs to you know political parties and all that. No. Journalism is not balanced. It is one way. And so it's, it, it's, it's, it's hitting on... One, we are already having challenges of non-professionals in the system... Yes. And now they are adding up. And mm. so even if they get people who can just speak, you know, we have that in the media a lot. They yes. only need someone who can talk, blah, 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 blah. And the person is put on radio. Indeed. And so people uh, some colleagues in Ashanti region have told me that mm -hmm. funeral MCs and funeral announcers are now some mm. of the choice materials for morning show hosts and several other rules in radio stations across the region. You see, so that is what, what, what the future of this noble profession is now. And so it, it takes us back to the licensing. Mm. Mm. If there is, if we are a licensed body, mm. we, we can, you know, have a stake in some of these things. But we are not a licensed body. How far can GJA go? Nana, how far? I had mentioned that was my final question. But with your mention of GJ, let me get mm. you into the field of controversy uh, mm. to end this. Mm. Has the GJA represented journalists enough? Mm. Have they actually stood up for journalists when it matters most? Mm. Mm -hmm. the, the GJ has not stood up for journalists like expected when it matters mm -hmm. most mm -hmm. yes they've done some work they've done something but when we expect them to really be up for us I have not seen that press releases yes it will come out beautifully written lot, beautifully signed stamped <laughs> from the GJA but it's not about writing, it's about action. Mm -hmm. We can write, that is what we do as journalists, but let's take action. There are several instances. 
I mean, we've seen press releases out there, but what happens at the end of the day? Unless they are doing something that they've not come out to tell us. Unless that shouldn't they have... be the case. At all. If they are, so far as we see the letters, let's see all the actions you take. That's right. If you want us as journalists to stand up and say, oh, GJA, Fred, they are up, they stand up for us, whatever we need and all that, they are always there. Once you are in trouble or once um, you have an issue, the Ghana Journalist Association is with you through it all. We've seen them do this because we have to cite something, but which case can we cite? Probably they have done some for other colleagues they should let us know. They should make it open, the GJA portals. Let us know all the actions you've taken over there. Thank God we have a website, but let us see some of these things you do As, without the press release. The press releases are fantastic. They are very fantastic, but we need more action than words. In Natalia Kwanza, what a conversation <laughs> we've had. Thanks for joining me on Pairs Down today. Truly grateful. Thank you for having me. Thanks for being with us today. This has been Pairs Down. Here, we tell the storyteller story. Journalism journeys. The CCTV camera comes to the journalists. It's turned on the journalists. What you don't hear, what you don't get to know, the things they grapple with, which they will never insert in their news stories because... The principles of news reporting do not allow it. Those are the things that we serve as the menu here. We'll be back next time with another edition. Thanks for joining us. Bye for now.